My name is Michael Battelle, and I'm the president and founder of the Fatty Liver Alliance. Today's incredible guest is Louise Campbell. Louise is the founder of Tawazan and health and medical director there. Louise has over 37 years experience working in the healthcare industry in the UK and elsewhere in the world, including Europe, the Middle East, and Australia. She was awarded the title Hepatology Nurse of the Year in 2018 by the British Journal of Nursing. In recent years, Louise has become one of the world's leading exponents of fiber scan technology for early intervention in the areas of liver-related conditions, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, enabling individuals, physicians, and healthcare professionals to have superior health and lifestyle. Louise has gained a wealth of experience in designing and delivering patient centers pathways, including fiber scan services. We are thrilled to have her with us today at the Fatty Liver Alliance to share all of her expertise and learn all we can about the fiber scan as a staple in the non-invasive technology world. Louise, you know so much about fiber scan technology and applications. Could you give us the FiberScan 101 course on what it is and why it has become so popular. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, get to talk about it because I think um, what we tend to think of FiberScan is purely one element of it. We tend to think of stiffness. We tend to think of kilopascals because it is currently a liver toy for liver people. Now, liver disease scares the pants off most physicians in most specialities. So therefore, it becomes too techno and we just refer on. But FibroScan, in essence, is a very simple tool that basically sends 50 hertz of sound wave through your liver and wobbles it. Um, it has an element of um, ultrasound, one dimensional ultrasound, which means it's regulated in some countries like the UK, but not regulated in others. Um, but essentially, that's all it does. It's a non-invasive um, assessment of liver stiffness. It is not a confirmation of liver disease. It is not a confirmation of fibrosis. It is an assessment to narrow down people who may have livers at risk. One of the other components, which is probably for me, arguably the most important component, is its continuous attenuation parameter, which is the ability to see, calculate, and assess the fat content of the liver. So what that leads us to find is people who are at risk of developing liver-related complications, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, high cholesterol, because it gives us a risk factor. We now know that high liver fat content is a risk factor for all of those conditions, and we can see it. But there will be a proportion of people who will develop liver fat and fibrosis because that fat agitates and causes the liver to fibrose and become stiffer over time. And we can monitor that with a non-invasive assessment that does less harm than a blood pressure cuff, because blood pressure cuffs, when they're pumped up really hard, can bruise you quite significantly. And yet we only give it access if you have been picked up as one of the very few who get detected with abnormal liver function tests. And there is no guideline in the world that tells you to use liver function tests to rule in liver disease assess the level of liver disease or rule it out. Your liver regenerates. It should be in the same condition the day you die as it was the day you were born. So therefore tracking down a blood biomarker in something that is constantly renewing its tissue is actually really, really difficult. And one of the reasons that fibers can avoid that, they just look for something that could indicate poor liver health, too much fat or too much stiffness. And that's as simple as it gets. So I, I wanted to ask you, because you, you use the term non-invasive, and some people might say, well, you know, what, is, what does that mean? And really, it's not going to hurt at all? That's what some people would ask, because they're not sure what a fiber scan is, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, all it does is have a little probe that sits between one of the rib spaces and physically taps the side and sends a 50 hertz wave through. If you are elderly 
and have no peripheral tissue around your rib cage, it can be uncomfortable because you really are the slim of the slim. If you have a normal subcutaneous level, on the whole, most people don't complain about it. When I've done children, they tend to giggle when it taps and make them laugh. Now, it's very, very difficult to get a fibre scan of somebody who's giggling, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult. Now, how many tests can you say actually made you giggle? And I think that's the key. This can be done very quickly in most people. And for me, the power is type two diabetes and heart disease are two of the biggest killers in the world. And we have an assessment device that can tell us who's at risk 20 or 30 years before they develop those diseases. And yet it is not even used for that location. It is only ever considered in relation to liver disease because we want to find those with liver disease. Now that is a kilopascal level on the whole of over seven. But if you talk fatty liver, we talk about eight kilopascals being a referral pathway, whether it's eight for kilopascals or eight for ELF, a FIBOR over 2.63, um, but indeterminate above 1.3. So when we talk about non-invasive, any blood test requires a needle but it is still termed non-invasive because we're not really going into the body. A fibre scan does not even involve a needle. Um, and a lot of devices, ultrasound does not involve a needle. It's non-invasive. We try and avoid going physically into anybody if we can. And I suppose most people compare this to liver biopsy, which is a very important invasive procedure, we do stick a needle through the rib cage into the liver because the liver is so protected because of its blood supply. And that's why everybody does not like the idea of it if we can avoid it, does not want to have one again if we can avoid it. But for some diseases, we do have to use liver biopsy. We need to know what the underlying condition is. We need to know, is it a true representation? I think the one advantage of fibre scan throughout the last 15 to 16 years, realistically, is it's been used with biopsy a lot of the time. So we know when you get an enriched population for hepatitis C, HIV co-infection, hepatitis B, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autoimmune disease, when you enrich those populations and you have a fiber scan result, and when you biopsy them, the result correlates with the tissue that the histopathologists will see. That is the strength. It doesn't mean that it is 100% accurate, but we've heard a lot in the last years about liver biopsy not being the most accurate because different readers will see different things in it. These are all assessments that try and put a jigsaw together. And one may say one thing and one may counterbalance that in a different way because sometimes they're not all compared together in the same trials at the same time. It, and we're trying to narrow down what should be the real trial devices. For me, it would always be something that includes where we're going to implement this in the real world. So how am I going to take out new medications to patients in the future? And how am I going to assess that? If it's never been done in the trials, and this is where we come into biopsy. Most people were not diagnosed in the future for fatty liver on liver biopsy. Therefore, how do they get these medications that are only proven in liver biopsy if you do not use a test like Fibroscan, like FIB4, or any of the other blood biomarkers? We need to be keying down that for me as to where do we go in the future when these drugs in the next few years are approved? And that's the exciting part. We will have something in the future that will be approved for fatty liver disease oh. and NASH specifically. That's coming. I wanted to ask Oh, it's you, coming. Let's go back to, um, you talked about kids. I want to touch on that a little bit, but you, you, you all, let's go back to where people are being assessed. How would a physician come to even think of a fiber scan? You know, there was a, a study that came out in Canada recently that said most medical, um, like family practice physicians and nurses, 
actually aren't that aware of fatty liver disease yet. And so how would they even know to, you know, to, to choose a fiber scan and what would make them think of that? Or, or should patients go to their physicians and say, hey, I have these risk factors like type two diabetes and obesity, and I'd like to be assessed for liver disease. And, and hey, can do you have access to a fiber scan? Is that something that a patient should do to, to bring up? It's something that we're trying to change. Uh, the UK, when we opened Towers and Health, uh, became the first country that I'm aware of that where you can walk in off the street and just get a fiber scan. Um, so it's more difficult in every other country. You need to hit a referral pathway. And if you look at referral pathways, even the new ones by the AGA, ESL, ARZLD, APARZL, they all state about a FIB4. So you have, a, for, certainly for fatty liver, you have a FIB4 above 1.3 and less than 2.6, I believe that the, um, the score is. Then you fall into that indeterminate zone. Yep. You then get a referral, but you rule out the reason for abnormal liver function tests. So you might do an autoimmune screen, you might do hepatitis B, you might do hepatitis C. There's a, every country will have its own guidelines. The trouble is you then have a patient in a guideline and that is the minority of people with poor liver health. I tried to get a fibre scan in LA for a client recently. I needed a referral and I needed $375. Mm -hmm. It is not a cheap test currently because it is in a medical pathway. Not dissimilar to blood pressure cuffs. 20 years ago, you never saw a blood pressure cuff outside of a hospital. Now, everybody I know over the age of 60 has got a blood pressure cuff at home. <laughs> People are becoming more self-aware. But for a condition like um, fatty liver, where one in four of the global population have it, that's a risk we can look at earlier. So that's what we're trying to drive, that people take awareness of their own health. And a lot more people post-COVID are taking an awareness. A lot of younger people use Fitbits, they use Google, they use Noon, they use all of these apps to keep a track of their own health. That's what we're asking people to do. Just be aware of your liver health, have that conversation. In primary care particularly, they don't have access to Fibroscan, therefore they don't know about it. At the British Liver Trust, for, the, uh, for an example in the UK, did a survey and I think only 26% of the United Kingdom population have access to Fibroscan. Now that is only in the great and the good liver units or specialist gastro centers. So that means that 74% of our country do not have access to it, whether or not you're in a district general hospital, whether or not you're in a specialized area, if you're in mental health or detox and alcohol, you have very little access. So it is not the norm, and that's what we're trying to break. This should be at the primary care level, from my perspective. It should even become before a blood test. If everybody knows their liver health, we've got a reason to look, because Fibroscan is often used to rule out any significant damage where you have an abnormal liver function test. Yeah. And in my experience, when I surveyed our, my last NHS unit, we sent back 92% of everybody we saw who had an abnormal liver function test or suspected fatty liver. They had fat, yes, but they didn't have any elevated stiffness is what we're concerned about in liver. Sure. We're not worried about the abnormal liver fat. We're only abnormal liver stiffness. So those are endocrine and cardiology patients who should be on pathways and diabetes review and nutritional assessments, but that does not happen. Now, I wanted to um, talk about uh, the FIB4 for a second. So FIB4, for sure, it's easy, it's free, and you can, but there is the indeterminate. Um, I did an interview uh, last year with uh, Dr. Richard Sterling, who was the, actually the inventor of FIB4. A lot of people don't know that. And he himself said it wasn't really designed for fatty liver disease. So uh, as an example, and I mentioned this to you before, I um, was in, in the indeterminate zone with the FIB4. I had an ultrasound and it didn't show anything. I had a series of blood tests and it showed just a little bit of fat. And then I, I did the fiber scan and, and I came in at 319 on a CAP score. And so I have fatty liver disease and I'm going to work on that. But that's a great example of what you just said, that it would it detected something that I was unaware of. So it gave me something that I could do for my own health. 
<laughs> Absolutely. And that was probably because you may have had an elevated AST or ALT. But if you've got a normal ALT or AST with fat at that level, you would not have been detected in any other way because you would never, never have triggered on the FID ball or any of the other scores because it requires an abnormality in a liver function or a liver enzyme test. And what we tend to see is that fat in people's livers agitate the liver. Now that agitation levels can sometimes elevate the stiffness because rather like a, if you scratch yourself, you will get an inflammation around that scratch. So if the fat is causing agitation to some people's livers, you might see an elevated stiffness, but then it triggers us to look further. And that's the key. Fibre scan is a trigger when it's abnormal to do a little bit more work. A normal liver function or a normal liver enzyme test does not mean no, do not look, except we default to feeling comfortable in primary care because the liver enzymes are normal, you don't need to worry. That's about as far from the truth as we know now with the Naffold and Nash epidemic and tsunami is that we know that it's, it's silent and it is very silent in blood enzymes because it regenerates. You have to damage an awful lot of your liver for most people before you will even get any symptoms or signs other than tiredness, lethargy and poor concentration. Okay, thank you so much for that. I wanted to ask you, because I think it's important for some people who want the, the, the little details too, what exactly uh, the two main, I guess it might be more, but the two main uh, scores, if you will, that people are looking at the CAP score and the fibrosis score. So what, is, what, is that, what do those numbers mean? What is the range? And just, just to explain that for a moment. The one that, was in, that we are used to, and I, one of the reasons why it's the only one that's currently talked about in clinical trials, is when Fibroscan, I got involved with Fibroscan when it was released in around about 2000, early 2007 for us. And we were one of the first units in the UK to start to use it. So at that stage, it only did stiffness because that's what we're concerned about. We're concerned about livers that are stiffer. That's an abnormal liver and it is often fibrosis. So that's why we talk about kilopascals. These are not the same kilopascals as an MRE elastography or 2D shear wave elastography, ARFI, Accuson 2000, things like that. There are lots of different formats of elastography. Fibroscan just happened to be predominantly the first, and it's the one that most people are familiar with, which is why people struggle to convert it into different measurements and different kilopascals. But ultimately, it's, it's, regulate, it's, it's, it's approved for different diseases, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis C, co HIV co-infection, NAFLD, um, autoimmune, and PBC. I think are the six that we have biopsy proven approvals for. So what they would normally say is anything less than seven kilopascals by fibroscan does not, does not show significant fibrosis and that's two F2 or above. However, that is in a non fasting condition. So you have to have fasted for fibroscan for three hours. What you will see in some people, if you do not fast that person, is an elevated stiffness that you cannot trust. You have to bring somebody back if the stiffness level is done non-fasting. What we will see in around about 90% of those people is that stiffness level will drop back into the normal range. So that may indicate, from my perspective, that there may be some abnormalities in the change of the liver. It shouldn't be stiff, fasting or non-fasting. It should always be soft. Because if you think about it, every time you eat or drink, if your liver became stiffer and your blood flowing backed up, we would have problems. Um, and I think um, Sven Frank has done a little bit recently on that that I've listened to on the parenchymal changes in the liver with fat, um, even at a lower level. So we want a fibre scan ideally under seven. For fatty liver disease, we want a fibre scan ideally under eight. Now, the reason they use eight is that that is a referral to a hepatologist for a review and probable liver biopsy 
if that does not alter in a few months with work up. So we want, we're enriching the population of people who may have significant disease. F2 and above is associated with liver outcomes. So if you get to F3 and F4, those outcomes become more in relation to liver cancer, liver cirrhosis, transplant. So we're looking at liver outcomes. That is irrespective of the increased outcomes for diabetes, development of type 2 diabetes, heart disease. And I think we have to put it into perspective. The majority of people who have fatty liver will have a cardiac event and, a di and an endocrine event. They will not have a liver event. So what we're doing is enriching the population to find the highest risks of those who have significant liver damage. Find it, we can reverse it in a lot of people because it is lifestyle. It will be the future medications. But most people don't know that they can make minor tweaks to their lifestyle and over time watch their liver soften and regenerate and do what it does normally, naturally. That to me comes with no side effects for that if we alter somebody's lifestyle. If we do it further upstream, so when they're younger, it means that's a lifestyle that's achievable and you can maintain your liver health. So Kela Pascal's is an important outcome measurement for us for somebody who's going to progress or has progressive liver damage. But it is only a stiffness level. We then have to do more workup. We will have CT scans. We may have liver biopsy. We will use ultrasound. We will use a lot more blood tests to try and put the jigsaw piece together. But what you've done is identify somebody whose liver is out of its normal considered ranges. So that's what Kela Pascal's are. If we then move to CAP, Control, controlled attenuation parameter. That came about around about 2014. And to put that into context, a lot of people, and they, up to three quarters of all machines in the United Kingdom only come with kilopascals. So do not give you the fat measurement of your liver. Is it 100% accurate? I think we think we know that MRE and PD, dynamic fat fraction are the most accurate at looking at liver fat. So for Ibriscan and the continue, the cap is the easiest way to say it, um, is a good measurement. There's been multiple studies now that show a cutoff of 280 will be high enough to give you steatosis that's quite significant. And on the Measurement for fibre scan, that would be graded as steatosis three. What is, has increased on the meta-analysis recently, or certainly to, to 2021, was a CAP score of above 248 is considered abnormal. So below 248 is considered a normal range of fat. So that's what we're trying to get people into. So when you relate to your cap score of 319 was it mm -hmm. we would want to get you progressively to get that down towards the 250 mark and below if you can how long does that take and it's not time? everybody's individual mm -hmm. we have a case history um on our website for example somebody who was scanned with only elevated transaminases for the liver enzymes and the gp was doing nothing for that person in 2014 they just wanted to get fitter, but their CAP score was two, 370. But what they did was get fitter. They did the exercise more regime. They got their CAP score down in five years or six years, if I recall, to around about 292. So still steatosis grade mm -hmm. three, but an improving risk, uh, a reducing risk. But what he then did during COVID was lockdown three, decide, right, that's not working. Let me change something about my diet. And they were eating biscuits and apple pies every day, high sugar content. Yeah. They dropped the sugar out of the diet in big portions just to a weekend. Now they normalized their liver fat within, I think it's six weeks. Ooh, wow, so that's... they are somebody who responds to sugar. Now they only lost 1.1 kilo to do that at that stage but because their diet has been tweaked so they have their treats at the weekend and they're healthy during the week they've maintained that weight loss and are a normal body weight and have recently been to canada and eaten a canadian diet but we're skiing 
fat, liver steatosis a couple of weeks ago was only 237. So again, remained within the normal ranges because they now scan regularly, but are just aware of eating more healthy and they'd exercise. So everybody's individual, but I cannot think of one person that I've ever scanned who changed their diet favorably, who didn't reduce their cap. And I can't think of anybody I've scanned who didn't reduce their diet or got worse, who didn't increase or keep their cap stable. So I think for the individual, it is a very good tracking mechanism. And particularly for weight loss, I think people, we get, we talk about 10% body weight because we're not measuring internally in the, and we know scales will measure 10% body weight. But for some people, that's really, really difficult. But it is not a, ma- a sprint, it is a marathon. It is about slow, steady lifestyle change to something you can really enjoy that makes you feel healthier that isn't a chore every day, because when it becomes a chore, you think about it all of the time. Never remove something completely because you crave it. There's a psychological mechanism that goes in that makes you crave it once you deny it. So it's one thing we don't do. We don't encourage you to go and crash diets. We don't encourage you to deny yourself anything. It is about tweaking for what's right for you. And that may take time. And I know multiple diabetics who have their biscuits in the afternoon with a cup of tea. But I know lots of people who say a cup of tea is an excuse for a biscuit. So we need to watch what we do (laughs) and when we do it. (laughs) So everybody is different, but everybody has the ability to change something small that can make such an internal difference. And I think there was a lot more evidence at Easel and Arzold last year. Mm -hmm. And there's more coming up in relation to the quality of the diet and the gut and what we feed our gut actually can benefit our liver in a lot of beneficial ways. Whereas quality, just losing rapid weight loss may not be the biggest key. We'll talk about microbiomes another day. <laughs> so, oh, that's, that's not my one. I go to Scott Harris for that or somebody right. else. <laughs> uh, so International Nash Day is coming up on June the 9th. What is your one message that you would share with people My one, mes- one message is that we all have a liver. We're all at risk. doesn't matter your size, your shape, um, or your body type. We, are, we all have a liver and we are all at risk. We've all eaten and drunk since we were born. And therefore, if you can, just get it checked. If you think you've got a risk, talk to your GP about it. I still hear lots and lots of stories. My, I've got fatty liver. I've talked to my GP. I've lost weight. And he says, I still can't reverse it. It's untrue because I've scanned a number of people like that. It is reversible in the majority of people if you make a difference. And every time you take an opportunity to know your liver health, it is an opportunity to avoid type 2 diabetes. It's an opportunity to avoid hypertension. It's an opportunity to avoid cardiovascular disease. We've seen some shocking figures from Tracy Simon and her team last year that showed that if you have a 17 year old on average age, I think it was, who has biopsy proven fatty liver, and that is just fatty liver, that was not fibrosis, one in 15 was dead of cardiovascular disease or extra hepatic cancers, two of the biggest causes that fatty liver gives in other diseases by the age of 37. So that, we did not bring our children. It it, it is very, very concerning with the obesity drivers in, 10 year olds and things now and yet we have a device whether it's fiber scan or any other device that can calculate these we have something that in primary care could offer us the window to stop somebody becoming diabetic or cardiovascular disease the liver component of kilo pascals is probably the minority we only think 20 percent of people with naffles will get liver problems so Fatty liver is not predominantly a liver disease, only 20% of it. That other 80% is is a different condition. And yet we haven't got the buy-in from endocrinology globally or cardiovascularly globally. The charities don't talk about it because the liver has always come with stigma. It's got to be the most sexy organ that you've got. It's the only one that regenerates 
It, it's amazing. We we definitely have work to People do. People live in the tile. <laughs> Uh, Louise, I thank you for today. And even more importantly, I want to thank you for all the work that you do on a regular basis uh, in social media and just reaching out to people and letting them know about the liver disease and what they can do to help themselves. Thanks so much for everything. And I look forward to future discussions with you as well. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yep, enjoy. Yeah, let's get the movement going forward. And everybody's got a liver. We're all at risk. <laughs> let's just keep it going. <laughs>